Aloha, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm going to send out our follow-up poll. So for those of you who took the first poll, these are the same questions, but they are um, now after you've watched the video. Um, so we'd like to see how, if any of your answers have changed since, since viewing. And I also want to introduce you to our panelists. So you actually got some introduction to them in the video. We have Gavin Ivai, who introduced me in the beginning. We also have Morgan Mamizuka, Annie Rosa. I was hoping we'd have Liz Kumabe here, um, but I don't see her. She wasn't able to be in our video. She was on leave. Um, she's been an educator at Hanama for a long time. And then we have Ku'ule Rogers and Sarah Severino from the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. And I'm gonna open the floor now. I'll leave the poll open and close it in about 15 minutes. So you can kind of take that at your leisure. And we have about half an hour to talk story. And I invite you to ask questions. Um, I'm really curious to know how their research has gone, especially since the bay was closed for much longer than we initially thought. So we filmed this episode right in the 1st of April and the bay has been closed since March 16th. Um, Can you ask questions verbally or you have to type it in? Go for it, ask your question. Okay, uh, so so uh, when you're snorkeling and you're looking at fish, some of the fish really don't care. They're doing their thing and you're having fun watching them. Some of the fish kind of head away uh, sort of uh, slowly, or but not in a panic. and. And then there's fish who have been hunted a lot and they have a really high spook fast factor and they just, they're out of there. And what I've always been curious about is uh, when you're studying fish behavior, which is really fun to watch, uh, is it the behavior of being hunted that causes them to do a lot of stuff as opposed to just being looked at? How do you differentiate between, I mean, I. I get it. They're going to die if they don't get the hell out of there if a guy's got a spear. But are they smart enough to figure that out? They seem to be smart enough to figure that out. Uh, you can see this in areas like Hanamo Bay where there are no fishermen with spears and there are a lot of visitors. So we look at a variety of different things besides just looking at how scared they are of visitors or how close they come. We're also looking at how it affects their feeding. And besides in other areas where you have fishermen, you also have predators. And where you have a lot of predators, you have the other fish that will spook more easily as well from anything swimming by. So we're also counting monk seals, turtles, a variety of other things. And we look at fish uh, biomass and fish, um, endemism and abundance and a variety of different fish factors so that we can see if any of these things are changing over time. We're even taking still videos and analyzing those still videos so we can see uh, any species changes or any type of behavioral changes as well. I hope that answered your question. It kind of does, but a lot of people say, you know, people really mess it up. I, I go to the Pupake Marine Life Conservation District a lot. Thousands of people do. And the fish, you know, in really shallow water, the fish really, in a lot of areas, just don't seem to care, which is part of why it's such a fun attraction, just like in Hanama Bay. And, uh, so I'm always curious what it is that really makes the spooky ones spook out. Certain species are more afraid, and it's the ones that are preyed upon, usually. Uh, even at Hanama Bay, you'll have some species that will come right up to you, even when the visitors were there, when there's a lot of people in the water. But we find that most of the species are actually coming even closer to us than they were prior to having the bay opened. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Thanks for that question. Thank you.
Oh, Kuule, you have a question in the chat box from some students. They want to know how, or, or maybe this is for Morgan actually, how old do you have to be to volunteer and what volunteer opportunities they can do, if any? I think they're eight and 11 years old. Okay, so um, usually if we're, we have volunteers come in individually, um, they have to be at least 16 years old to volunteer like more independently. But we do have a few volunteers who are younger than that and they do come with their parents. So um, they're about six and eight years old as well. Um, so we, we do make exceptions if um, younger volunteers want to come in along with uh, a chaperone or parent. Good question. <laughs> their mom is willing to come. Yeah, come on down. <laughs> So I think it's down to the uh, volunteer opportunities part. Um, so the volunteers at Hanama Bay are uh, the folks who are kind of like the front line. Um, so they're the ones who are interacting with the visitors. They're helping to, um, you know, get them acquainted with the bay. We educate them in the visitor center, in the theater where we play the orientation film and then also down at the beach we have a kiosk where people can come up and ask questions uh, whether it's about the bay itself or about the marine life that they're seeing in the water um, so really a key part of what the volunteers do is interacting with the public and educating them um, about the bay and about uh, marine conservation how they can protect the bay so that it's um, here for years to come for folks to come and enjoy Sure, actually, I'll put in the chat um, our email um, and the link to our website, and that's where you can get a volunteer application online, um, and you can contact us as well uh, for more information. I have a question for Sarah um, for, and Kuule, I guess. I've seen a lot of reports in the newspaper and UH News has published findings about the water clarity and that you guys are finding it's clearer since the closing compared to even the off days because Hanama is normally closed one day a week. Can you just tell us some of the findings of your work since the bay's been closed? Yeah, we have been seeing um, clearer water. And like we explained in the video, the way that we're quantifying that is by using that Secchi disk method. And uh, what we found when we did these studies previously in 2018 is that the water was 30% clearer when you compared open days to closed Tuesdays. And we're actually able to share some information with you guys about how much clearer it is now during the closure. So I have a little graph for us to look at. Um, here we go. And here it is. So we have our different areas of Hanauma Bay down here back doors, keyhole channel, and witches brew. Meanwhile, this is all in the inner reef flat, so just before the waves break. Um, and then we have visual water clarity distance here on the y-axis. Days open to the public are in that dark black. So this, this information is from 2018. Days closed to the public, so Tuesdays in gray, that's also from 2018. And then our lighter bars are COVID closure, Secchi disk methods. And what we're seeing is that it is significantly clearer on during the COVID closure versus our closed Tuesdays and our open to the public days. And it's around 42% clearer on our COVID closure days when compared to open to the public days. So that's very exciting. <laughs> Is that something that you can visually notice the difference of, Sarah? 
I think so. I'd like to think so. We go in and we're, we're walking down or we're driving down and we see the bay and we're like, wow, it looks like a really good visibility day. And then we get out there and we're all like, oh, I wish I had that extra camera with me to take more pictures. <laughs> so I, I'd like to think so. I'd like to think that we can see it. <laughs> can you explain the Witch's Brew, uh, which is a place most people don't go to. It's a place where there's a lot of circulation of water and, uh, and it has the least amount of visibility. Uh, yeah, maybe it's because yeah. the current is stirring things up out there, but it, it would surprise me if uh, those results uh, have an awful lot to do with people impact. Can you, can you interpret those, those bars there? Of course. of course. So where he's looking is right here on the graph. And what we're seeing here is that even though we really only get less than 5% of snorkelers and waders here in Witches Brew, we do see a pretty low visibility as compared to other sectors. And what we have to realize is this is the inner reef flat, so it doesn't get as much um, water circulation as the outer witches brew area that you might be thinking of. Um, on the inner reef flat, it actually just kind of circulates in witches brew and stays in one place. And it also has a lot more wave action coming in, which could kick up sediment again and suspend it in the water column. So although we don't see as many snorkelers, that may not be where that sediment in the water column causing it to be more turbid is coming from. It could be from these environmental factors, which is also very influential to our visual water clarity distance. So wave action, um, tidal coefficient, so how high, high, how high is the high, high versus how low is the low, low. If that different, if that um, value is much different, then you're going to see more water stirred up. I have to go, sorry. So one thing I'd like to add is that you're seeing more of this sediment in closed days during the open period, so on the Tuesdays. And you're still seeing higher water quality now during the COVID period. So this means that the fine sediments continue to be resuspended over at least a 24 hour period. So if it's only closed one day a week, that sediment continues to resuspend throughout that week. So you're not seeing it drop down to any baseline levels without people. Kulule, you also have a question from George about the Seki disc and if there, you're doing any other more quantitative measures of water quality? Well, we also do sediment trap data. So we have sediment traps out there and we see how much sediment actually lands on the corals. Um, there's also water quality taken by a variety of people. We're having people at the Nature Conservancy and also the Department of Health come and take water quality data as well. So for the sediment, that's pretty much the two methods that we use. Can you describe a sediment trap, Kule? It's just a PVC pipe that has a baffle in it so that if waves come, it can't resuspend. It's like a little waffle, uh, like a lighting piece. And um, it will keep the sediment there. So we can leave it there for a month or more at a time and see over a time period how much sediment settles in that area. And each of the areas are very different than one another. Like Sarah was mentioning, which is brew, can often have more sediment than others. So are you seeing a change in your sedimentation rates then between say normal uh, week and Tuesday when it's closed and then during the shutdown? I'm sorry, what, what was the question again? If you're measuring sediment, are you seeing a similar change in sedimentation rates as you're, as you're seeing in the Secchi disk quality uh, visibility? Sarah, you wanna take that? So we haven't yet been able to process our sediment traps during this time. 
um, but we will get you that information as soon as we do and we discuss that with city and county. Uh, we did have some sediment traps out over the hurricane, so that'll be quite interesting to look at. Uh, but really, we usually place out these traps for anywhere from a week to a whole month, 29 days, which is what we did in 2018. So it's uh, an average sedimentation over that time period. We don't really see how much it compares from an open day to a um, closed day to the public. But we will be able to look at our open time period and compare that to this COVID closure time period once we have those sediment traps processed. I also have a picture of one of the sediment traps in the reef here, just in case anyone is um, wondering what they look like. They are just these little PVC traps. So you stick them out there and they hang out at the same level as the substrate so that they can simulate how much sediment is actually falling into that area of reef. So very, very simple. <laughs> I also want to add that we are taking temperature um, at the same time. We have loggers that continuously, every 15 minutes to half hour, record temperature so that we can tell over the entire year how much the temperature is and how much it's changing. And we can relate that to the bleaching surveys that we do each year to see how well corals are doing. because in 2014-15, when the state of Hawaii had such a huge bleaching event and 35% of coral was lost average in the state, Hanama Bay actually lost only about 9% of their coral there. So it was much lower than other places on Oahu and lower than other places, uh, the Big Island was hit the hardest, but for many other places other than Lanai. We had a question earlier for the Hanama Bay education folks about the bay reopening and, and what that's looking like. So we haven't had any announcement on a reopening date for Hanama Bay. So uh, we are continuing with uh, education kind of in the format that we have right now, like the Voice of the Sea and the, the webinars and, and reaching out uh, online to uh, classes to participate with us, as well as, you know, keeping our, our volunteers um, updated and trained uh, online. So as it stands right now, there isn't a reopening date for the Bay. And so I see a question about uh, the numbers of people coming to Hanamu Bay. So right now, under the current uh, COVID restrictions, uh, whenever it would reopen, it would follow whatever, uh, you know, laws and restrictions that are in place at that particular time. And then um, the city and county of Honolulu is the, is the management agency for, um, you know, the numbers of people coming to the Bay. So um, they would be in charge of the numbers coming. One of the things that we talked about in our making of the episode was the fish behavior and both Ku'ule and Sarah talked about how they would track that and we had a question about how do you follow fish and my question is did you guys notice any changes in your COVID studies or is that something you're still working up the data on? It, the analysis for the um, flight initiation distance, that's what we're calling it as we're approaching the fish and we're calculating how much um, space is between us and the fish before it flees. The analysis is actually quite time intensive, so it might be a little bit before that um, gets to um, the public. And also one of the things is that a lot of our COVID closure surveys, they will be um, 
piggybacked with when it opens. Yeah, so we're not going to be able to see if there's a change until we do these same types of studies after it opens back to the public. And one of the things that Annie brought up, which I think is really interesting, is that when the bay does open, it will have to follow COVID procedures. So how many people are coming in um, might be reduced. And what will be interesting is if we can observe these fish behaviors during that slow reopening phase where they're only allowing limited amounts of people in and then they're kind of ramping it up over time. So that'll be really interesting for analysis of our videos as well. A good opportunity for us. <laughs> a couple other things we're looking at is coral recruitment to see if it's different during the closure than when it reopens and also looking at coral growth to see if corals are growing faster or not as fast when um, the bay is completely closed as to when visitors return. So there's a variety of different things that we're trying to narrow down and see if we can find these differences and be able to associate these things with the population. We were able to when do that. I'm sorry, go sorry ahead. when they reopen, you know that it's going to be spaced out and slower, or is that an assumption? Because what's happening over here on the North Shore is uh, well, let's just say there aren't any parking places, tents are up, there's it's just choke, choke, choke with people. Uh, a lot of people aren't working, maybe that's why, but uh, don't think that because there's COVID restrictions per se in a generic context that that's going to reduce the attendance. Uh, yeah. We're seeing just the opposite over here. I, I see exactly where you're coming from. The one unique thing about Hanauma Bay is that it is regulated from the top. So X amount of people can only go through that theater per 15 minutes because they all have to watch that video. And if we're restricted to only having you know, let's say max 20 people in that room at a time versus, uh, Annie, do you know how many people are usually allowed in the theater at one time? So the, the ca capacity of regular time is 125. Yeah, so that could reduce it for us, just having to go through the video. But we do not know what the procedure will be when they do open. When you do your water quality tests, uh, the, uh, the state has a testing program. And uh, are there other agencies that will come out and test water also? I mean, your Secchi desk is great for suspended solids, but <clears throat> uh, I'm just curious what else you have the capacity out there to be checking on. Well, we are working with the Nature Conservancy and they're taking water quality data throughout the state. And so they have come during the closure, uh, during this COVID period, and they will be coming again to compare the water quality at that time. So your next thing on the 13th is about wastewater in Hanama Bay. Oh. Is that based on studies that are already been done or that's something pending for the future? I'm sorry for any confusion. Our next episode next Thursday, our Hanama talk is about cesspools and wastewater, but it's about throughout the state of Hawaii, not just in Hanama Bay. So the, the talks are the Thursday Hanama talks and Gavin and the Hanama Bay Education Program have partnered with me who, Kanisa, I also work for Hawaii Sea Grant. And um, so they're themed in that sense that they're part of our Voice of the Sea series for an episode we've done this year. But next week will be about cesspools and wastewater across Hawaii. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to send out my last poll. Um, and again, thank you for bearing with us as we trial this um, way of interacting. Our last poll is just a series of four Likert scales. So it's before the Zoominar, how interested were you? After the Zoominar, how interested were you? And again, it's optional, but we'd appreciate your feedback. 
And then I have my own personal interest question that I'd like to get Gavin to answer for us. And that is um, tips on underwater photography. We want to capture those fish and invertebrates that we see. Give us some pointers, uh, please. <laughs> uh, just gotta have patience um, and you gotta, gotta get lucky. Um, sometimes just being in the right place at the right time. I mean, morning is usually good. Um, you know, shallow water, you don't have to deal with your pictures turning blue and green unless you have filters for your camera. Um, so that's usually the best areas to take it. Um, but it's all about patience, I guess, and luck. <laughs> so that's my tips. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I also know that you go very frequently, so maybe um, mm -hmm. it's also a matter of persistence. <laughs> yeah, persistence. Yeah, I mean, I'm usually in the water pretty much throughout the whole week, so um, I try to get in different water activities, and you know, just shooting is just one of my hobbies that I like to do. So um, it, it's great because it kind of turns snorkeling into a double hobby so, with the photography. We do have one more question in the chat and it's about sort of the environmental and moral ethics of reopening the bay in the near future compared to the benefits of letting the bay rest. And I think that's a, a topic people are discussing for Hanama Bay as well as other areas across the world, really. Well, okay, I think personally, it would be nice to have more locals using the bay during this time when we don't have as many visitors to the state. But as a researcher, it's also the great opportunity that we have to be able to see what's happening during this closure. Uh, unfortunately, it's not up to me. <laughs> so this is something that the state of the city and county of Hawaii and um, the management agencies will have to deal with. I think we probably have time for one more question or comment if there's anything that our panelists would like to share. I did um, see one of the questions that had to do with coral bleaching during this time and it talked about possibly not having bleaching this year, but we are already seeing paling in other parts of the state, other parts of other reefs on Oahu. So we do want to let you know that if you can go out there and survey your reef, uh, we've developed a tool as the Coral Reef Ecology Lab to monitor health and it's called the Hawaiian Koa Card. And I can um, put in a link to that in the chat but this card actually lets you go out and survey the reef and it tells you how, what the health of the coral is. It's a proxy using color. And what we did is we brought corals into the lab and simulated a bleaching event and we took their health parameters and their colors and was able to kind of transpose that and we developed this card. So if anyone is interested in getting out to their favorite reef and taking a pre-bleaching survey this month, that would be amazing. And then you can upload your data to the web and we're actually able to track where there is coral bleaching and where there isn't. And why that's important is because if there are populations that are more resilient during these high temperature times, we want to understand why maybe they are that way. So yes, there may be still be a bleaching event, unfortunately, this summer. Hopefully not as bad as in 2014 and 15, but still keep your eyes peeled. And for those of you who don't have a Hawaiian koa or coral health assessment card, you can get them on any of the islands at the Division of Aquatic Resources offices. And can you explain what you mean by paling? When corals are uh, 
uh, introduced to any type of stress, temperature, sediment, anything else, they start to lose their symbiotic algae. And this gives them their color. It also gives them their food and their energy source. So once they start to lose this, the color starts to fade, except in those species that have their own fluorescent pigments. So sometimes you'll see some bright blues or some bright pinks during bleaching events. And that's because the little algae have left, but you still have the fluorescent pigments. Otherwise, all you see is the transparent uh, tissue and underneath the white skeleton. So as those algae are leaving, the color is leaving until it completely is white. And if temperatures continue, then the coral will eventually die. Speaking of coral death, as it relates to Pocillopora meandrina, that has some senescence, what is the average lifespan of, uh, it kind of grows fast, gets pretty big, and then there's a whole bunch of dead ones around, and you don't know whether they've been there for, you know, two or three years or 10 or 15 years. I mean, there's, there's all these clumps. Right, that, that's a really good question because it's one of the only genera of corals that have a specific size that we'll get to. The other corals can continue to grow for hundreds and hundreds of years. But like you said, Pocillopora meandrina, which is one of the first species to come in and recruit, is often one of the first species to die in high temperature events. It's most susceptible. It has a very low tolerance for temperature. So you see that a lot, but it will recruit. It will get only a certain size. We do not know exactly what size because it depends on the water conditions in different areas. But you won't see very large colonies like you do in the lobe corals and in the finger corals and some of those other corals. Thank you. It looks like we've reached our, our three o'clock mark. And um, so I want to honor everyone's time today and just say mahalo. I really appreciate everybody coming out and videoing in and awesome questions and awesome information. So round of applause. Hey, mahalo. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. all for tuning in. Um, this Thanks, is, everybody. This will actually be recorded. So. It will be available on our Hanama Talks if you missed any of it. So um, stay safe and hope to see you guys all next week for August 13th um, for the cesspools episode. Okay. Aloha. Aloha.